Hey everybody, thanks for listening to Well Driven Nails. I just wanted to let you know that this is the last episode that will drop for about a month. We'll come back to you in early or mid-November. We're going to continue recording, so we're not taking that time off. Please let us know if there are any topics you'd like us to hit, and we will consider it. So let's get to today's episode. So my name is Andrew, and I'm an addict. (laughs) Hey, Andrew. (laughs) (laughs) Oh, man. So the topic today is addiction. And I want to start out with just personal testimony about addiction. Um, We may have friends and family members that we've ministered to through or are currently ministering to in uh, terrible addictions, addictions to uh, pornography, addictions to drugs, addictions to um, things that uh, might kill them. But they're run-of-the-mill addictions too, um, if I can call them that, um, run-of-the-mill addictions that we uh, face every day. Uh, Currently, I'm in the midst of learning about my own addiction to caffeine. And a week ago, I started to cut off all caffeine intake. And that really comes from experience. Um, Seven years ago, when I was on sabbatical and I was dealing with uh, intense anxiety and panic, I cut caffeine because it seemed reasonable that I should cut off this stimulant that might be jacking up my nerves and um, really did it uh, not not in a spiritual sense, but really physically. It was a medical sort of decision that I wanted to um, cut off caffeine. And, And so five, probably four or five years, I was you know, decaf only, stayed away from tea, did not drink any soda, just it was water and decaf coffee or, um, <clears throat> but a couple of years ago, just, you know, you want a little boost. So you, you know, I'd have a half cup of coffee in the morning and then it becomes a cup. And then a few months later, it's like, ah, that was good. And it doesn't seem to be doing anything bad to my body, I think I'll have a cup and a half, and then it's two cups, and then it's three cups. And then it's two cups of cold brew, which is like extremely caffeinated. I have always been one, I like coffee, but I like good coffee. Right. Right, I don't don't like weak, watered down cafe coffee. I like- Something robust, like a good Hawaiian or Jamaican blend. Yeah, blonde roast of any kind. And, and, you know, don't be fooled. The dark roast doesn't have more caffeine. The blonde roast has the most caffeine. And it has the best flavor because it's not overcooked when they- when they uh, roast the beans. And so it has a nice nutty flavor. And I, I just love coffee. I love good coffee. But good coffee has a lot of caffeine. Oh, yeah. Okay. And cold brew has more than even a good cup of hot coffee, brewed coffee. You know, so that's what I've been drinking recently. And it just came back to me that I need to, I need to fight this. I need to give it up. And so seven days ago, started that process, and right now as we record, I've got a terrible migraine. Terrible migraine. And I had one yesterday, I had one the day before that, and today, you know, yesterday it was very interesting because about 10 o'clock, man, it just hits me. I haven't had any caffeine up to 10 o'clock, and then... Uh, it hits me. This migraine hits me. And I shut my eyes. I lay down on the couch. 
uh, in my office. And I'm like, and my body is demanding caffeine. My body is telling me, give me what I want. Mm. And I know that if I go to the fridge and fill up a cup in about 10 to 15 minutes, that headache will be gone and I will feel normal. And so I made it about another hour. So that's got to be but, an incredible temptation. Well, today, you know, today the same sort of thing happened, but it, I made it till later in the afternoon. I didn't start getting the headache till afternoon, maybe one o'clock. And I knew that if I just walked to the fridge, filled up a cup of coffee, that headache would be gone. Now, yesterday, I did give in. Yeah. And in 15 minutes, I felt almost euphoric after I took uh, – I, I had a half a cup of cold brew. I had a half a cup. My headache went away, and you just feel so – Good. <laughs> and then and then today I'm like don't don't let your body demand that you know don't let let your body make that demand on you S choose to suffer to get over this. And so look, it's caffeine and and people may laugh at that. Um, but I, I would imagine, and I've never been addicted to hard drugs. I've never been addicted to heroin. You know, I, I haven't had, praise God, I haven't been addicted to those things. But I can imagine that the cravings are exactly analogous to what I'm feeling. Uh, just judging from what you just said, I, I would say they're identical, you know, yeah. uh, in, Richard Pryor's book, uh, uh, Prior Convictions and Other Life Sentences, mm -hmm. his autobiography, he uh, described what it was like to deal with um, cocaine uh, issues because he, he was smoking it, mm. you know, and he would say that he, he would try to quit and that the pipe would actually start talking to him. It's like, come on, smoke me, smoke me, mm. you know. So, yeah, yeah. I, I mean, that's that's exactly what you're dealing with, you know. And I'm dealing with my own with tobacco, yep. you know, with cigarette smoking. Um, and, and I haven't done as well as you have this week because I I can't go that long without one, and, and uh, a few hours maybe. Mm. And then when I do light up, it's. You know, you get the, oh, I'm relaxed all of a sudden. Mm. I, so I'm high strung when I'm not smoking. And then that just takes all the nervousness away, all the, you know, anxiety away. Uh, but not for long. You know, it, it returns and then I have to smoke another one. Mm. You know, the longer period of time I go without one and that first one that I do light up after a long period, I actually get lightheaded. Yeah. yeah. That right there should tell you there's something wrong with cigarettes that to smoke one can make you dizzy. <laughs> How long have you smoked? Since I was 14. Yeah. So that's. Do, have you quit for any extent? 40 years. Yeah. Have you quit for any extended period of time? What's the longest you've gone? I, I've quit for, uh, you know, a few weeks. Here yeah. and there, and then I would. the The problem is, and this is what I've always said: if I could quit all my other vices, yeah, I could quit smoking. So if I could quit now, it would be the same one. You have coffee. If I could quit coffee, then I could quit cigarettes. But before it was alcohol, mm. you know, um, I couldn't drink and not smoke. So I would go through this period where I'd go weeks without smoking. Then I'd go out with a group of friends and we'd go out drinking. And before the night's over, there's a cigarette lit. And then I'm buying a pack before the, before I get home. You know, so it, it's just been, 
oh yeah, very difficult to, to walk away from. And like when you consider all the things that I did walk away from when I came to faith, uh, and you're like, you quit all those things. How can you not yeah. quit the cigarettes? Yeah, interesting. C- cigarettes are, uh, they're very tough. You know, it's, it's, it's an opiate for sure. I mean, we're going to have to transition at some point to speak of the sort of – to really talk about the word addiction right. and really what it is, but then also talk about addictions that don't have this physiological connection. I mean, I'm dealing with withdrawal, right? as as are you with nicotine. I oh, yeah. mean, you, it's nicotine, me, it's caffeine, and there's physiological withdrawal. Right. It's, it's, uh, yeah, it's more than just something behavioral, right? But then I wouldn't say I would I wouldn't take it to the extreme that others do and say, well, alcoholism is a disease, or drug addiction is yeah. a disease. No, Parkinson's is a disease. Rheumatoid arthritis is a disease. I think we have to be careful. I mean, uh, about talking about addiction because. It's not again. It's not a scripture word, but that doesn't mean it doesn't mean that we can't use it. There are a lot of uh, concepts and even theological concepts that where the word doesn't appear, but we have to be able to describe it. And I, I think addiction helps when it comes to when you're dealing with a situation where you've you've buffeted your body in a certain way, and your body expects to have that stimulus, and when it's taken away your body afflicts you, right? That There's that physiological thing. But there are all kinds of habitual sins that we participate in that are not addictions, you know? People talk about being addicted to pornography or being an addict of pornography. There may be something physiological about that stimulus, you know? Um, but... To, to talk about addiction is to, is to, like you said, take away blame or culpability, right? It is to make, uh, it is to say that you're a victim of your circumstances. You're a victim of the drug you're taking. You're, you, you know, and, and something in, in you predisposes you. To that, whereas we want to, we want to say no, 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 sin. <laughs> right, right. We would say that you're predisposed to sin. <laughs> yeah, yeah. In every way. <laughs> right, right, right. The the yeah. consequences of the fall of mankind into sin are pervasive, yeah. everywhere present. And so, yeah, we we are predisposed to sin in in so many ways. Have you known people? Have you ministered to people who have? Hard addictions, drug addictions. Oh yeah. Yep. To one. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. And they will. They're so in bondage to this that they will do virtually anything to get it. You know, many years ago, uh, the person I'm thinking about here would have. Um, done anything to get it in in a manner that he would have stolen to get it mm-hmm. a, a, anything like that now it, it's not that's not the case he, he wouldn't he wouldn't go so far as to hurt others to get it but he has no uh no will to not hurt himself you know mm-hmm. I, I mean he will go without food mm-hmm. you know? and he makes decent money so it's it's not that he should be going without food, but that he will for the sake of the drug, mm. you know? Yeah. I've known, I, I've known people who have stolen from loved ones, stolen significantly. I mean, mm. if you have a cocaine habit, you need a lot of money and, and, uh, there are cheaper drugs you could use, but, uh, you know, people get addicted to certain things and in bondage to certain things and it, and it costs and they'll do, and it goes beyond, you know, it goes beyond stealing. Um, women will sell their bodies in order to get money to, um, fuel this, this, this bondage. 
And there's a, an incredible amount of self-deception involved in addiction because there's no acknowledgement that you are an addict, you know, um, even though you know you habitually do these things, you know, and many people who are addicted, oh, I can quit that anytime. But they can't, you know. And well, well, why don't you? Well, I just don't want to, you know. No. Why? D yeah. Even though they they see some of the wreckage, right? Right. So why don't people want to quit? I don't know. I have no idea. I mean, I, I actually want to quit smoking and it's, it's, uh, but talk about that. But why I, do you, I know, why do you, why do you want to quit smoking? I want, I want to quit smoking because I genuinely feel that my body is a temple, of the Holy spirit okay. and that I'm damaging it, you know, when I do that. Okay, so there's a spiritual component. There, there's definitely a spiritual component. But, you know, it's not just cigarette smoking. I I want to stop eating Oreos at late, late night before I go to bed, too. Food. You know? So, f yeah. yeah uh, man, food's another one we yeah. could add to the list. Yeah, and, and food is one of those things that most people are probably in there when it comes to gluttony, you know, and just not realizing that, uh, not even realizing that they're, doing harm to their bodies why why is food in that category when how do we or how do we uh, use food because we use food as a comforter too you know to uh, uh to uh ward off anxiety or things like that you know but how in the world does that work how uh, how does know. stuffing have, your have face you, with oreos you've had oreos right i do like oreos <laughs> and i do they do taste good, but I'm just trying to think, why in the world is it true, and it is true of all of us, right. that stuffing our guts is somehow is us coping with uh, disappointments and pain and losses and the fallen world, right? Uh -oh. we, somehow food becomes... I Food is like a hug. <laughs> You know, yeah. it's like when you've got nobody, you know, that food just embraces you. And it's not just any food, you know, I mean. Is it, is it, does it distract us from? It could, I would say I it mean, it, does. is that why we eat? It just distracts us from our anxieties and our burdens? There have been some studies that say that chocolate does precisely that, you know. That there's this sort of euphoric thing that chocolate do, does to your body, you know, releases endorphins or something. Yeah, you know. Well, let's let me let me reveal more about myself and how pathetically sinful I am. There have been a few times in my life where I have had pain medication. Uh, kidney stone. I had a couple surgeries, uh, fistulotomies that had to do with Crohn's disease. I've, I was prescribed, oh, the typical opioids, right? Right. I think it'd be an o opioid, not an opiate. All right. Opioids, they're, they're, they're the synthetic heroin, pretty much. Right. Oxycodone, roxycodone. Laura tabs. Yeah, yeah, know, exactly. Like Hydrocodone. Um, Percocet. Percocet, yeah. And, and I, you know, it was, I had to be very careful in those circumstances because I felt like, um, uh, I got a feeling of euphoria when I took them. Right. And the temptation for me, it didn't. It didn't give me much pain relief, right? It it right. it just didn't. It, it, they don't really didn't help with the pain. They took the edge off, maybe, maybe. But but what was tempting to me is, as I walk through life as a depressive, and to suddenly feel euphoric and happy, and to have a psychological change where I could. Um, it was a boost, you know, that's what became the temptation to me. It, it wasn't even the sensation of, it wasn't even the sensation of chilling out. Most of the time it just made me fall asleep. But every once in a while there was just this feeling of euphoria 
and I was happy. Oh, yeah. Or my body was sending the signals that I was happy, right? It was working on my brain in a certain way. And that, that I think is what people are after. You know, it, it's not, it, it's, maybe it's, maybe there are certain drugs where it's the feeling of high. They just like to get high, right? They hmm. just like, but I think mostly it's a, it's a psychological pain reliever. Right. And, and oh, opioids are perfect for that. You know, I mean, it's a, uh, one of my opening jokes I used to do as a comedian was I'd be drinking scotch on stage and I'd say, I'm drinking scotch and taking lower tab prescription pain medication. Right on the side of the bottle, it says alcohol may intensify the use of this drug. Well, thank you for the serving suggestion. And the combination of those two things together mm. was incredibly stimulating, you know, um, so yeah, I get where you you're coming from with those particular things. Yeah, and yeah. and I think honestly, when it comes to uh, people pursuing these pleasures, pursuing, uh, and I I don't just mean being high. I mean the psychological relief and all these other things. I I think if a person hasn't chosen to endure pain, endure psychological pain, endure living in a fallen world, endure suffering, they will never overcome any addiction or any bondage to these things. There has right. to come a point, and it, it isn't like, it isn't the point of, I got to think about this. It isn't the, the, I mean, some people come to the point where like, if I keep doing this, I'm going to die, right? It's going to shut right. down my liver. It's going to, it's going to shut down my kidneys. And, and that's, you know, some people will quit because of that, but others, it it has to be, and they're not at that point, but it ha they could very soon be at that point, but they're not at that point, but they have to like, they have to come to terms with the fact that this life is suffering. This life is hard. People sin against you. You sin against other people. The conscience is burdened by things. And unless you embrace suffering and then that suffering makes you turn to God for relief, uh, I just don't think you'll ever give up your addictions. I don't think you'll give up your drug. Right. You know? It's a conscious choice to not have your good things in this life and to have them in the next. Right. We, we, need, to, we need to go to Scripture now. And it's, I think First Corinthians six twelve is is one of those um, pillars that you have to go to when it comes to anything you're in bondage to. All, all uh, the Apostle Paul writes, "All things are lawful for me, but not all things are profitable. All things are lawful for me, but I will not be mastered by anything." Right. That idea of being mastered by something yeah. and that it has power over you. The only thing that should have power over us is, is God and his word, right? And any competition to that, any idol that comes in and vies for uh, our attention, but also asks us to bend our will to it, yeah. right? That whole... You know, my body is demanding that I get that coffee, right. right? And that is, you know, only God should have that place in our wills. And uh, anytime, anytime anything in His creation takes that spot, then we're being we're being mastered by it. It's it's dragging us around. It's informing our will instead of the Word of God. But it, and it may be lawful things too. He says, right. I mean, all things lawful. Yeah, it 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 may be food. Yeah, it doesn't mean they're good for me. Yeah. Right. It may be TikTok. Right. It may be scrolling through social media. Right. It may be that screen time. It might be entertainment. Um, those sorts of things. I mean, some 
I mean, question yourself. Is a day without entertainment just an abominable thought to you? You know, a day without having two hours to flip through those, those 15 second reels. Is that really worth living? It's like a day without sunshine. <laughs> it's ter I mean, but but brother, we're in such bondage to to such foolish things. You know, and all those things we, we would say are lawful, but we are not to be mastered by them. The other that I was looking at was Ephesians four. Um 17 to 24, the whole section here I think is very important. So this I say and affirm together with the Lord that you walk no longer just as the Gentiles also walk in the futility of their mind, being darkened in their understanding, excluded from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them, because of the hardness of their heart. And they, having become callous, have given themselves over to sensuality for the practice of every kind of impurity, with greediness. But you did not learn Christ in this way, if indeed you have heard him and have been taught in him, just as truth is in Jesus, that in reference to your former manner of life, you lay aside the old self, which is being corrupted in accordance with the lusts of deceit, and that you be renewed in the spirit of your mind and put on the new self, which in the likeness of God has been created in righteousness and holiness of the truth. I think what's interesting is that the apostle says that the Gentiles walked in the futility of their mind, and that that is no longer the way that we are to, to walk. And by Gentiles, in this context, he's just talking about unbelievers, pagans, right? They, they, they have the futility of their mind, and they're walking in that. They live in that. Their understanding is darkened. They're excluded from the life of God because they're ignorant. They have hard hearts. And because they are callous, they give themselves over to sensuality and the practice of all kinds of evil. Okay? And so that is somebody who's in bondage to their, to drugs, to anything. But then he says, you know, lay that aside lay aside the old self that's being corrupted in accordance with the lust of deceit be renewed in the spirit of your mind and put on the new self so there's this put off and put on right right you got to put off all of that bondage all of that that corresponds to unbelief and futility of the mind and you have to put on the new self and the new self is the self that's been regenerated by the spirit, that's been, you know, the mind has been undarkened and enlightened, that the the heart and the will have changed. This is re- the regenerate Christian. And they put on the new self. And so I think I I, I think the principle there that I want to draw away is this idea of putting off and putting on. You, when it comes to those things that we're in bondage to, it's not enough just to put them off, right? We we often try to defeat our the things we're in bondage to by just putting them off. You know, I'm just not going to do this anymore. I'm just you know, it's it's going to be willpower, right? I'm I'm just going to will that I don't do this, and we don't repl- we don't then put on anything. And so I, th- I think when it comes to fighting the idolatry of addiction, if we want to call it that, yeah. you, you do have to put it off. You don't go back to the idol. But then you have to fill it with, okay, what is going to satisfy me, right? It, um, instead, of, instead of facing my anxiety f- by smoking a cigarette, I'm going to face my anxiety by – memorizing the word of God and meditating on the word of God, right? It's putting off and putting on. And that, that takes spiritual maturity. It takes time. It takes desire. 
right? We have to have that desire. And, um, and honestly, a cigarette just seems a lot easier. But it doesn't deal with our anxiety, obviously, because we have to keep going back to cigarettes. With any sin that we might engage in, we have to put off and put on, right? If you're, if you're greedy, okay, put off being greedy. But what do you put on? You put on being generous, right? Give your money away. Um, care for other people financially, right? right? Share what you've gotten. Cast your bread upon the waters. And so that's that putting off and putting on. You know, if it's food, if it's food that you go do for comfort, well, put off going to food for comfort. And where can we go for comfort? I mean, it's so silly right. to say it, right? Right. Go to the Word of God. Go to right. brothers and sisters in Christ. Find some fellowship. Go right. to prayer. To the fruit of the Spirit. That we have to do the work of putting off and putting on. And so if you if there are things you know you're in bondage to, don't just think, I've got to get rid of this. You really have to identify what you're going to put on, right. what you're going to pursue. Because we always relentlessly pursue things that satisfy us. Right, and you're going to replace it with something, right? And, yeah. And that's I, how a lot of people quit doing this thing. They exchange this for that. You know, um, so yeah, rather than exchanging this for just another <laughs> another addiction, exchange it, exchange the old self for the new self. I was thinking about taking, rather than just the old self doing something new. Right, I was thinking about taking up cigarettes so that I could get over my caffeine addiction. <laughs> I was thinking about more caffeine intake to stop smoking. So you're doing the opposite. It's just like we're we're, <laughs> we're changing. I'll give you my cigarettes and you can <laughs> give me your cold brew. This is terrible. <laughs> don't do it. No, don't do the don't cold do brew. It. Don't do the cigarettes either. Mm -mm. Yeah, this this one too I thought was good is uh, Galatians 5.1. For freedom, Christ has set us free. Stand firm, therefore, and do not submit again to the yoke of slavery. Yes, Christ has set us free. Free to live a life that is filled with suffering, but also filled with joy in the midst of suffering. There we, we get to live in paradise. Mm -hmm. Right. We will get to live in the presence of God, and Scripture and God promise to us that there will be no pain, that there will be no tears, and he will wipe away our tears, and there will be no death, and that's when we get our good things, right? And so in the, this life is a life of following in the path of Christ, who suffered, who was rejected, Right, who um, didn't have a place to put his head down and rest, and that's that's going to be the same for us. We can't we can't go to psychedelics. We can't go to trips. We can't go to um, psychological relief valves, which come through drugs. Mm -hmm. um, we have to go. To Christ, and we have to ask for perseverance. But I realize the temptation is huge. Right. The temptation is great. It, it'd be much. It, it all of us want to check out. Right. All of us just want to want to check out, and and it's because we suffer. Yeah. It's because there's pain. It's because we have been sinned against. You know. Yeah. And we have sinned against others, and our conscience is burdened, you know. And 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 so, yeah, we and we want relief from pain. I mean, how many, particularly women, you know, are addicted to what's been prescribed to them? And why do I say women there? I just think women are safer than men. Men will go out and find what they want. Women mm. will want the justification of a prescription. Uh, to go after, you know, to find relief. And so I just, in ministry, it seems like I've, I've known a lot of women 
older women who have been addicted to pres- what their doctors have prescribed to them. Yeah. And it's not been helpful to them. But they've made the same choice not to suffer. They just, they believe they're entitled not to suffer. Yeah, so when dealing with these things, we go to the Lord in prayer, we go to the Lord in his word. Um, but not that we don't do the work too, you know. Um, we rely on the Lord, but we need to we need to do the work ourselves. Was it uh, Augustine who said, uh, "Pray like uh, it's all God, but work like it's all you." <laughs> yeah, yeah, it is an amazing amount of work, and and really, we need to do the work of self examination because I think we'll identify many, many things that we run to before we run to God. You know, it could be fantasy books. It could be literature. Uh, Well, I think you covered this a few months ago. I can't remember which sermon it was, but you were talking about uh, going to God and asking him for things that somehow we're afraid that we don't think God can do that, Mm -hmm. you know. Um, that God can't take that away from me. I have to do that on my own. Um, but no, you can actually go to you can go to God in prayer and say, "Hey, take this from me, please." You know. Yeah. We can. He can do things. <laughs> you know. We sometimes. I think that was the kind of the point of what you were saying was that sometimes we think God can't do these things, but God can do all things. You know. And the devil convinces us that there's a quicker way to relief or there's a more immediate way or that God isn't capable of it and so you better go after these these you know you better eat the Oreos right I mean in going to those things in seeking our comfort there it's unbelief I mean this is a spiritual issue it fundamentally it's a, a spiritual issue And it could be that my caffeine is a spiritual issue, right? It doesn't feel like it. I want to give myself a pass. But, and I love the ritual of coffee. You know, I love the flavor. I love the taste. But I know what it does to my body, and yet I go back to it, right? And, uh and I've learned what it does to my body, and I still go back to it. And so is there a certain level of unbelief in this? Yeah. Not trusting the Lord. You know, why is it that I need this? Um, d- you know, why can, why can I not find satisfaction in, in what God has given to me in his Son, yeah. fundamentally? And certainly that's what we both experienced when we came to faith. There were certain things where it was like, okay, that is gone because I have Christ. Right, right. But there's things that didn't go away. Right, there's still these persistent sins. And perhaps God God allows those things so that we go through the little fights that we're having right now and we learn about our sin and we learn about ourselves and then it's a test it's a test to know whether or not um, we prize Christ in the way that we should it, it is not I don't think I'm over speaking at all to say that being in bondage to anything is to have an idol that you're serving to go back to the put on put off I just want to hit that home. I, I, uh, some of the new thetic counselors call it dehabituation and rehabituation. You have to dehabituate yourself from that which is sinful and that which is holding you in bondage and keeping you immature. And you have to rehabituate to those things that are good that God has told you are good and right and true and beautiful. And trust him that they are those things. Trust him that, you know, they, that, that the way to relieve your anxiety really is what he says in Philippians 4, which is to present your requests to him in prayer with thanksgiving, right? right? It's like, 
You got to really believe that. And so we, we need to, um, dehabituate ourselves. We need to, like, there has to be this, I keep going back to this thing. Why do I keep going back to this thing? Huh. What is it about this thing that I think I need? Why do I do what I hate? Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Yep. Romans 7, the Apostle Paul. And why do we keep going back to that thing? And we'll justify it in a thousand different ways, right? Yeah. We'll give ourselves a pass on it. I mean, we can't, we can't be reading the Bible all the time. We can't be in prayer all the time. We can't be worshiping God all the time. Look, it's going to be God in my cigarettes. It's going to be God in caffeine. It's going to be God in cocaine. Yeah. <laughs> Whatever. It's going to be God in food. It's going to be God in reels. And that's pathetic. I mean, that really is pathetic. And I'm calling myself pathetic and saying that. So there has to be this dehabituation. There has to be, I keep going back to this thing. Why? Examine yourself as to why you keep going back to that thing. What do you think it provides you? What service is it for you? What good is it doing to you? And really think that through. And if you don't have good reasons for that, then it, it must be killed. And then rehabituation. It's, you can't sweep out the one demon. The sevens, seven will come in, right? You, you have to, figure out what is good and make it a habit like an obsessive habit like you have to be obsessive about going after the good right you do have to get in the word of god you do have to actually pray you do really have to examine yourself before you come to the lord's table you know th those things that God has told us are good. You really do have to love your wife. You really do have to build up your brothers with with um, kindness. And wouldn't it be wonderful if Christians were known for being sort of uh, in bondage to doing good <laughs> to their neighbor? Being in bondage to one another's needs. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Yeah, outdoing each other in love, mm. uh, covering over a multitude of sins by love, right? And uh, caring for the needs of the saints and um, showing spiritual concern for those who are going after their sins, warning a brother to flee from his sins. You know, those are the things that we should be like zealous to do and give ourselves to. Instead, we're zealous to fuel our bondage to the things of the earth. You might remember where Paul calls greediness idolatry, right? Idol greediness, which is idolatry, he says. And, it, and you, you're perplexed on that. It's like, well, there's a difference between greed and idolatry. Right. But, there, but apparently there isn't, right? right? Greed is to love money more than anything else. Right. That is idolatry, right? Mm -hmm. On its face, it's mm -hmm. idolatry, right? And so all these other things that get our attention and our time and our devotion are idols, false gods, let's call them, right? False gods that, that attract our devotion bend our will and demand that we obey them. And we're like, <laughs> yes, sir. As long as you give me, you know, five minutes of feeling chilled out, as long as you help me forget the death of my child, you know, whatever it might be. Right. right? When, right. As long as you help me come to terms with the fact that I just lost my job. <laughs> Well, yeah, who, who is the God you go to? <laughs> yeah, what God do you go to? When things are rough, when things are painful, when you get news that shakes you to your core, and the doctor tells you that you've got 
cancer, where do you go? What is your first thought? You know, what are you going to rely on at that point? This is a fallen world, uh-huh. right? And and sin is awful. And a sin, sin touches all of us. I mean, we're born in sin. And so there's... <laughs> There's no escaping the effects of of sin, and and God provided His Son and has rescued us from that domain of darkness, right? But but until we are in His presence, there is a lot of suffering to go through, yeah. right? And and we and that's that's okay. Yeah. This is what God has ordained. You know, and and you don't need to eat food in order to escape that. You do not need to resort to opioids to avoid that. You don't need pot in order to avoid that. You can actually lean into it, you know, so to speak, and, and wait and be patient and suffer as as the Lord Jesus Christ suffered, right? Man of sorrows. Yeah, because no matter what you go through in this life, I can never be equivocated to that agony that he went through on the cross. And one day after we've suffered a little while, (laughs) all that suffering will disappear. Man. The tears from our eyes, the sorrows, all of that will be washed away. Hmm. And then we'll find out what true euphoria is all about. Yeah, that makes me think of a bunch of passages from what you just said in, in Peter's writings. Um, who is there to harm you if you prove zealous for what is good? But even if you should suffer for the sake of righteousness, you are blessed. Do not fear their intimidation and do not, do not be troubled, but sanctify Christ as Lord in your hearts, always being ready to make a defense to everyone who asks you to give an account for the hope that is in you, yet with gentleness and reverence, and keep a good conscience, so that in the thing in which you are slandered, those who revile your good behavior in Christ will be put to shame. For it is better, if God should will it so, that you suffer for doing what is right rather than for doing what is wrong. The momentary light affliction that's producing for us an eternal weight of glory. Right, This life, even though it is filled with suffering, is described as momentary light affliction. And that's because hell is eternal, heavy affliction. And the Lord Jesus Christ has saved us out of that. And so whatever we suffer in this life, and I know that is hard for some people to hear because they have suffered sexual sins against them. Um, they have been betrayed by those that were closest to them, right? They have lost and lost and lost. But even still, it's momentary light affliction. <laughs> You know, you've lost your health. Your body does not do. You're always in chronic pain, but still momentary light affliction. It is, it is not bearing the wrath of God. So it's momentary light affliction. And, and I think understanding that, getting that into our mindset that this life is, is suffering, um, of a certain type is what will help us not go to idols for relief. Right. Right. We will trust God. We will hope in God. We will wait upon God. Thinking pastorally, I would I would urge those who are in bondage to something that you begin the process of that dehabituation. You begin that process of of confessing that sin and talk to your elders and talk to your pastor and just say, look, this, this has me tied up. This is an idol I'm serving right now. So 
tell me, tell me how to put off and put on. How do I overcome this? What does this indicate about what I believe and what I don't believe? What does it indicate about myself? What does it indicate I put my trust in? And have those conversations with, with your pastor. Yeah, and if you're a member of this church, definitely lean into your pastor and your elders because you're in a church where they actually care about your spiritual welfare. You know, and, and even your your fellow brothers and sisters here in the church talk to somebody. You know, um, that, right? If you're if you're we're a, here to join in, yeah. in your suffering, we're here to suffer together. Uh, that's right. To share in one another's sorrows and in one another's joys. That's that's why we're here. To ride this ark until <laughs> we make it to the promised land, right? To, <laughs> right? to go through the stormy waters of the Jordan until we cross over the river into the celestial city. All right? We, we carry one another. And so if you're addicted to prescription drugs, confess it. Right. If you're addicted to illegal drugs, confess it. Right. If you're a, if you're a glutton and you can't imagine life without food and drowning your sorrows in food, if it's alcohol, if it's entertainment, right? If you find that you can't keep your mind focused on the word of God because you've, you've so trained it by reels, confess it. And let's begin to like figure out how to put off and put on, right? Fight against these things. The devil will tempt you. The devil will push you in a certain direction. And he doesn't want you to worship God. He doesn't want you to make progress in the faith. So he's going to suggest to you all kinds of idols. And they're not ways of escape. God will provide the way of escape, but the devil will provide the, the way of entrapment. <laughs> 